recording here. Very good. Looks like we've got a, a good group on here. Look forward to speaking with all of you. My name is Randy Souter with CIC Services, and I will be really your host. And our guest is Sean King. Sean is an attorney CPA. He's a principal in our firm and a founder as well. And uh, we'll be talking about, you know, financial and risk management strategies for your small and mid-market clients in a prolonged COVID-19 environment. Now, notice it says prolonged. There's a reason for that. Sean will speak to that as we go. But, uh, you know, we want to we help you as advisors advise your clients for the long haul, if you will. So we would ask, keep your phone on mute unless you uh, are asking a question. And then go back on mute. Uh, Sean and I will pause a few, you know, from time to time uh, so that you can ask questions. And it's great to see all of you here. And then what I would also ask, we'll be glad to send these slides to you. Uh, my email is going to be at the end of this. So just shoot me a note, ask for the slides. We'll be glad to share them. As I mentioned, uh, our, our speaker today is Sean King. As I, He is an attorney CPA principal in our firm, resides in Puerto Rico with his lovely family. Sean is a visionary, always on the front edge of trends and what's going to happen. Uh, he's a student of technology, a student of business, a student of finance, a student of insurance. Uh, so uh, he's uniquely qualified uh, on this topic and certainly qualified for a wide range of you know challenging topics that business has faced and how to position businesses for success in the future and recognize what's coming and how to get ready for it. So we're we're thrilled to have him as our as our guest speaker today. Uh, this is me. I'm Randy Sadler. I've been in CIC Services eight years. CIC Services helps businesses own their own insurance company, uh, take on some or all of their risk, uh, turn that into profit and wealth. And uh, my risk management background really started uh, when I was a tank commander in the Army and uh, headquarters company executive officer where I took care of uh, the lives, well-beings of soldiers and equipment, and learned a lot about safety and risk management uh, in my really my first mis risk management role. So, I'm honored to be your host. Like I said, we'll see you in the slides, so we won't spend a lot of time on the bios. CIC Services, our company, we help businesses own their own insurance company, uh, assume some of their risk or all of their risk, turn that risk into profit with good risk management practices. So you may have uh, business owners that should think about owning their own insurance company, and we'll talk about that some as part of uh, COVID-19 and part of preparing for future similar events. So let's dive in. Uh, the first thing we want to emphasize, because Sean and I were talking a lot about you know, COVID-19. COVID-19 is uh, a black swan event. Uh, so Sean, what do we mean by black swan event? Yeah, thanks, Randy. You were kind of choppy on my end, so hopefully everything, everybody can hear, uh, hear me okay. Um, but yeah, technically, Nassim Taleb, who kind of coined the term black swan, he says that, uh, that this is not actually technically a black swan because it was reasonably foreseeable. We had a, a, a decent number of prognosticators, including Bill Gates, who have been suggesting for a number of years that uh, a pandemic um, outbreak would have exactly the consequences that we're experiencing today. But in general, a black swan refers to an event that by and large, most people never saw coming. It's something that isn't factored into the risk management models typically. And as a result, people get caught by surprise um, from it. So a black swan is something that I wouldn't say is unforeseeable, but I would say that it's largely unforeseen in that it's not a risk that many people have spent much time uh, factoring into their overall risk management plans. Uh, Taleb, who coined the term, notes that there are really two types of risk, what he calls type one and type two. Type one risks are easily foreseeable sort of risks. They are uh, the risk uh, that you take or that the casino takes when you go gamble in a casino. Um, the, the law of large numbers typically applies in this context with a, uh, uh, a very high degree of certainty. You'll typically see risk distribution fall on a bell curve, kind of like what you see here. 
And so when you sit down at a blackjack table, the, the, the casino knows with a very high degree of certainty that if enough hands are played and X amount of money is bet, uh, it knows uh, exactly how much profit it's going to make, uh, with, you know, almost to the penny at the end of the day. Um, so that's type one type of certainty, which is very easily foreseeable and, um, and much more easily quantified. Type two uh, risk, on the other hand, if you'll advance to the next slide, yeah. Andy. Yeah. Uh, these are not necessarily unforeseeable, but they're often unforeseen. Uh, so we'll call them less foreseeable. These are more black swan type of risks. These are the risks that the casino takes that, uh, that fire breaks out and destroys the casino or that a, that a meteor lands on top of the casino while you're sitting there playing blackjack with its carefully calculated odds. So uh, type two type of risk is much more difficult, not impossible, but much more difficult to model, uh, often not planned for um, because it's, it's less foreseeable. Um, the big problem that society has, in Nassim Taleb's opinion, is that uh, we often take models that do a very good job of quantifying type two, I'm sorry, type one risks, and we apply them in situations where black swans can happen. And we'll talk about what those situations kind of are here in just a, uh, a couple of minutes. Um, but his point is that it's a catastrophe waiting to happen when you think that you have your arms around risk because you're using a model uh, conceived under type one circumstances, uh, but you're dealing with actually risks in a type two type of scenario, which is uh, somewhat like has happened with the, the pandemic disease outbreak. Next slide, Randy. Yeah, so Sean, as we think about, you know, black swans, there's often those that benefit and certainly those that, that suffer. Who might be suffering now and who is benefiting? And this applies also to other types of black swans. Exactly. The critical thing to understand and always remember about black swans is while you can't necessarily predict what the disruptor will be exactly, we don't know whether it's a meteor strike or a solar flare or a pandemic disease. We may not be able to know with certainty what the disruptor is, but we can know with a very high degree of certainty that given enough time, some sort of massive unexpected disruptor is going to happen. And when that happens, there are certain types of businesses that are very adversely impacted, others much less so, and, and that may even benefit. Uh, what are those that are severely impacted? Uh, well, they're typically businesses that are highly optimized or highly leveraged or, heaven forbid, both. If you have a highly optimized, highly leveraged business, uh, think of a hedge fund, <laughs> and, uh, and a black swan comes along, you are going to go bust. Um, if you have a just-in-time inventory system and your, uh, your supply chains that literally span the globe to China get disrupted, uh, you very much risk going bust because you have no inventory cushion. So if you're highly optimized, highly leveraged, or both, you're going to almost invariably suffer in a black swan type of scenario. This, by the way, presents some really interesting investment opportunities. Um, you can sit back, you can be very conservative, you can hold a lot of cash, and you can just make tiny but highly leveraged, using options or those sort of things, bets against businesses that are highly optimized and highly leveraged. And uh, you may do that for a decade and lose a little bit, lose a little bit, lose a little bit. But eventually that black swan comes along and that bet um, pays off potentially massively. As far as who's benefiting, uh, well, that really depends on the exact nature of the black swan uh, to a large degree. But generally, businesses that are more robust, that are less leveraged, businesses that have redundancies, if you have multiple uh, sources for your supply chain rather than just one. Uh, you have a less chance, for example, of your supply chain uh, being disrupted. In, uh, in today's world, we can think of two examples of people in the same general industry 
one of whom is getting decimated currently and the other is whom is, is benefiting at least financially currently, and that is physicians. If you're a physician doing elective surgery, we have a, a, a client, an orthopedic group, 56% of their revenue came from elective surgeries. And as of 10 days ago, the state banned all elective surgeries in the state to preserve supplies to fight COVID-19. Uh, their revenue dropped by 56% overnight. They are getting decimated. Uh, by contrast, if you're one of the physicians, an ER doctor, <laughs> You're working overtime. Um, you are uh, working your butt off, and you and members of your group are uh, using ventilators and doing, you know, high dollar interventions, trying to save uh, people's lives as we as we speak. So that's an example of two people, the same industry, medicine, physicians, one of whom is getting decimated, and the other of whom is benefiting from the same black swan. Very good, yeah. So let's transition into the strategies because we want, we want to share strategies that advisors can share with their businesses. The first, uh, preserve cash. Uh, let's speak to that, Sean. What are some things to keep in mind as we think about preserving cash? Well, in this type of scenario, if you're a business owner, um, you can have a highly profitable sound uh, with the exception that you may have been overly leveraged and, and or overly optimized uh, business model, and you can be decimated, you can go bankrupt simply because you run dry on cash, maybe through no fault of your own. Maybe you're doing fine, but your counterparty, your main supplier or your main customer who owes you a bunch of money goes belly up and you have a massive accounts receivable that you can no longer collect, and so now you can't do your payables either. Um, so in a situation like we're in now, where there's a, uh, a massive financial crisis, the most important thing is holding dollars, holding cash, liquidity, not running out of money. So there are various ways we can do that. Um, you can obviously look to cut costs, and a lot of people, first place they looked, unfortunately, was payroll costs, which is why we had, you know, more than a million, <laughs> unbelievable, one month, a million uh, unemployment claims in a single month, astounding. And that's going to be far, far worse this month. Um, or tap credit lines. We're, you know, we're suggesting to clients, look, 2008, 2009, the banks got strapped. And what did they do? They needed to raise capital. They needed to, to shore up their balance sheet. And so they started calling in credit lines. They started declining to renew credit lines. And the last thing you want is to be out of your line when the bank decides to, uh, to non-renew it. Uh, you want to have that baby maxed out when the bank decides to non-renew it. Because whoever has the cash has the leverage in those negotiations. And, and though they may pull your credit line uh, or refuse to renew it, if you've already maxed it out, you can at least negotiate a uh, maybe a five-year payout note or some other reasonably favorable terms that will allow you to uh, to preserve cash. So one is to tap out credit lines. You can even borrow against life insurance policies to raise cash. Um, if you do that, though, you don't want to keep that cash on hand in a uh, in the same bank account that you have your line of credit because most banks will have a security interest in that bank account. Instead, you'll want to keep that cash in a, probably a government money market fund that has uh, check writing privileges if, uh, if we'll still open up a, a new account for you today. Yeah, so many of you are aware our federal government just passed some, some pretty large scale programs for COVID-19. Uh, Sean, what are some of the ones that, that uh, businesses ought to be jumping on right away? Well, there are there are two main ones that are ma made available to uh, to small businesses across the country, uh, and they are both phenomenal. The one I'm going to focus on today is called the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And if you haven't learned about it yet, and you yourself are a small business owner or you serve small business owners, you're certainly going to want to uh, to study up on it because it is an unbelievable deal. Essentially, starting tomorrow, small businesses all across the country can submit a simple two-page application to the Small Business Administration, along with some supporting documentation. 
And um, what they can do is the, um, the bank, you can use pretty much any bank to do this. The bank will look at your payroll from February 2019 through February 2020, and they will uh, determine your average monthly payroll cost, which includes your compensation paid to your employees, it includes compensation paid to independent contractors, it includes um, state, but not federal, uh, payroll taxes, it includes 401k contributions related to that payroll or pension contributions related to the payroll. But you'll calculate your total average monthly payroll cost between February 19 and February 20. And then they will automatically loan you two and a half times your average monthly payroll cost. They'll loan it for two years at a half a percent interest. That alone is pretty phenomenal for many small businesses, but uh, it gets even better because if you use that money to cover payroll or for the next eight weeks, to help cover payroll for the next eight weeks, and or you use it for certain other pre-approved purposes, rent being one, mortgage payments being another, interest on pre-existing debt, debt that existed prior to February 2020, um, you can, uh, and you use all the money for that purpose or however much of the money you use for those purposes, the government will completely forgive in eight weeks. Think about that. You can get two and a half months of your payroll, two and a half months of your payroll loaned to you now, almost immediately, provided that you don't reduce your payroll by more than a certain threshold amount over the next eight weeks, and you spend the money for payroll and these other approved reasons, the government will completely forgive the loan. Cash money in small businesses' pockets. And even more impressively, that does not count as loan forgiveness for federal income tax purposes. So the small businesses that get the, get the loans forgiven um, can uh, can potentially have uh, uh, tens or hundreds, in some cases, millions of dollars given to them um, tax-free under this program. Yeah, that's fantastic. So definitely, uh, we've got the link down here, uh, or any bank really that, that works with Small Business Administration as SBA approved can help get you through the process. So advise your business clients to jump on this now. And Sean, what was the it other one? First come, about? first serve, Randy. That's right. It's first, first come, come, first serve. serve. So uh, don't wait. There's 386 billion, and once they run out, they run out. So you want to be one of the first uh, people submitting applications, or your clients do if they can. Absolutely. There's also a COVID-19 economic injury disaster loan. Anything? Any highlights on this one, Sean? Yeah, this is a longer term loan that is um, not forgivable, but it's on very good terms. Um, essentially, the Small Business Administration will make loans to small businesses for working capital and uh, loans up to $25,000. They can be amortized over as long as 30 years at, I think it's like four or 5% interest. So unbelievably uh, cheap money. Um, made available to for working capital that small businesses can use for uh, for any reason. So uh, those loans aren't forgivable like the uh, the Paycheck Protection Program loans are, but um, it's still uh, another option for businesses who need to raise working capital to uh, survive the downturn. Very good. These, these, both of those programs, by the way, are only available to small businesses with uh, less than 500 employees. If you have right. more than 500 employees in February, you're not eligible. That's right. Yeah. So 500 employees or less. Sean, you and I talked about, you know, some businesses may not have thought about this, but many business owners or some of the, some of their key people may have uh, some cash surrender value in life policies. How can that help right now? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for all the same reasons that it makes sense to, to raise money and to have liquid cash immediately on hand should you need it, uh, the same is true with life insurance. We in the life insurance industry, or those of us who have a background in that industry, want to think that that money is readily available and easily accessible. And 
And, you know, it probably is. But in today's world, I'll tell you, um, I myself went to take loans against my life insurance policies last week just to make sure that I had liquid cash on hand that I could access at a second's notice. And I'll tell you, all those life insurance company call centers that are normally staffed aren't. It was a long, long wait. I finally got a hold of somebody. Um, the, the, it took them forever to answer my questions because the people they would normally ask were, were, were at home, working from home and were not available. Um, it, uh, I, I asked them to overnight a check to me, and they were, which they normally do all the time, and they were unable to overnight checks because the people who would physically take those checks and put them in the overnight package and fill out the form to send it to you weren't there to do that. They're, they're, they're too uh, sent home um, as part of the social distancing measures. So I was on the phone for nearly four hours trying to get a few life insurance policy loans and uh, still ultimately wasn't successful. They ended up emailing me forms that, um, that I have since completed and sent in and I should be getting the money in a, in a few days now. But, uh, you know, that was seven, eight days ago that I started that. So it may take much longer than you suspect in today's sort of environment to access money that you may think is normally even very liquid like life insurance cash surrender value. So better to go ahead, start that paperwork now, request that money now while you don't need it. You can always set it aside in a government money market account or somebody somewhere super safe. If you don't end up needing it, you just pay it back. And, uh, but if you do need it, um, it'll be invaluable. Well, interest rates are low right now. So when we think about strategy two, we've got the irony of preserving cash and, and tightness in the liquidity markets, but interest rates are really low. So uh, really good time to think about long-term, short-term debt if you can refinance it. Any other thoughts on this strategy, Sean, as we talked about it? It is a great time to, to, to potentially refinance debt. Um, you know, you're going to have to be able to, I think banks are going to be, <laughs> Uh, you know, a little tighter. They're going to want to make sure that you're still a viable business even after the, the turn down before they're going to want to, uh, you know, help you in that regard. But sure, certainly if you are a business that is one of those that happens to be benefiting or at least breaking even in, in this current black swan environment, uh, there's no time like the present to potentially refinance uh, debts. Unbelievably inexpensive interest right now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's an interesting strategy that some businesses have thought of, others probably haven't, but you might have insurance for the interruption that you're going through, or your supply chain might be insured. So, um, Sean, what are some strategies when you think about filing insurance claims as a potential way to get through the crisis? Whether it's a commercial insurance policy uh, from an unrelated third-party commercial carrier or whether it's an insurance policy that you purchase from your own captive insurance company, it's worth scrutinizing those to see if any of the losses that you're currently sustaining may be insured. Um, you know, a lot of commercial business interruption policies have a lot of exclusions in them. And, uh, and they're much harder to collect on, but there may be opportunities in some states. I think New Jersey, maybe New York, are putting a lot of pressure on some of these um, property and casualty insurance companies to honor business interruption claims, even though technically pandemic disease is, is excluded under the policy terms. So uh, it's worth at least looking into that. And certainly if you have captive insurance that insures business interruption of various types. It could be supply chain interruption, loss of a key customer, loss of a key supplier, loss of a key contract, um, accounts receivable that's no longer collectible that you may have had insured under a captive insurance policy, um, regulatory and legislative changes, um, administrative actions, these edicts that are coming down, these executive orders that are coming down from the governors, putting everybody on lockdown and closing businesses by executive order, you know, those are administrative actions. And um, some of the losses, at least, some of the expenses associated with complying with those administrative actions um, are very likely covered under administrative actions policies issued by uh, some captive insurance companies. So, 
absolutely, this could be a source of important liquidity and it's worth most businesses checking into. Absolutely. Another thing too, we've, uh, we do encourage businesses, if they haven't done it before, consider finance, financing your insurance premiums. Uh, that, that's a way to spread out costs, keep cash in your pocket uh, and pay those over time rather than all at once when you are renewing your commercial policies. So definitely tuck that one away. Now, number four, Sean, you and I were talking about, you know, just the, the dangers of, of panicking, if you will, uh, and maybe just throwing up your hands and quitting. A lot of businesses shouldn't quit. Uh, give us the circumstances under which businesses should keep going, even if it looks like they're losing money. Yeah, I think this is a much was a much more relevant conversation a week or so ago before so many governors started um, <laughs> mandating that businesses shut down. But back then, I was talking with a business owner client who I think really should have known better. So don't don't assume sometimes that your clients know as much about business as you do. Even sometimes your very successful clients in business. Um, I was talking to one of these clients and he was saying how he was going to be shutting down his business. And I asked him why he was doing that, you know, and he said, well, I, I can't even make enough money to pay my rent. And so, you know, I asked him a few more questions about that and said, you know, um, let's talk about that. Why, um, you know, rent is a fixed cost and whether or not you should continue to work and, and generate revenue depends not upon whether you're able to cover all of your fixed costs, but whether you're able to cover all of your variable costs. If, if you can sell widgets, each widget, for more than it costs you in variable costs to make that widget, then by all means continue making widgets because every, every dollar of um, margin that you take in in excess of your variable cost is at least money that you can direct towards rent. Maybe you can't cover it all, but certainly if you shut down production, you're not gonna be able to cover any of it. So it's kind of economics 101. You keep producing as long as you can cover your variable costs, uh, fixed costs be damned, um, but you'd be surprised at how many small business owners don't really grasp that. Right. And then, you know, keep the brand alive as well. Important. Uh, and then also keep your employees if you can, especially if they're trained. And obviously the, uh, the government loan can really help with that too. So, you know, one of the strategies, if you do have, um, if you do have uh, the ability to, to run profitably, but not cover all your fixed costs is, is think about slow paying or no, no paying some creditors. Uh, Sean, how would we advise uh, clients if they were thinking about, you know, not paying some of their bills? What advice would you give them? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, this happens a lot. It's it's a common business technique, regrettably. When businesses get in trouble, they'll start slow paying or no paying certain certain creditors. And, uh, and you can certainly do that. And uh, in general, though, the biggest thing to remember is just make sure that the IRS is not one of those creditors that you slow pay or that you no pay. Uh, pretty much every other debt that you may have that you owe to any creditor is going to be dischargeable in bankruptcy. Um, those other creditors are going to have a very hard time potentially going through the court system to put liens on your property and those sort of things. Not so for the IRS. Um, debts to the IRS are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. They will haunt you for the rest of your life. Um, very easy for the IRS to slap a lien on your house or um, garnish your wages or do any number of those sort of things. And it's especially important not to fall behind on payroll taxes. Uh, there's actually personal liability for, any, for anybody who oversees payroll, they are personally liable if their employer uh, fails, in some cases, to remit payroll taxes timely, and they had any control or influence over that decision, as most small business owners would. So um, normally, you would never want to slow pay or no pay taxes. I will say, though, that as part of the, uh, the, the economic stimulus over the last couple of weeks, Congress has extended the tax filing and the tax payment deadline from April 15th to July 15th. 
Um, so for that's for the 2019 taxes. So those who would normally owe taxes or be filing their taxes soon and would have to pay maybe some money with their tax return, they can now wait until July to do that and not be subjected to any sort of penalties. Um, and I don't believe interest either, um, uh, so long as they pay by July 15th. And there's also been uh, some relief on payroll taxes. Businesses are given, I believe, until later this year. I forget the details and the exact timing on that, but uh, they're given some more time to, to remit and to pay those payroll taxes. That may be something you want to do, but man, that's scary because if it comes time to pay those taxes in a few months and you just don't have the money because you have bankrupted by then, um, that debt is going to be hung around your neck for the rest of your life. So um, I would think long and hard before I were to uh, to take advantage of not paying those payroll taxes. Absolutely. Or delaying the payment of those taxes. Absolutely. Very good points. So find my mouse here there we go uh so let's think about strategy five this one may be obvious but maybe to some it's not um sean we talked about postponing purchases especially you know any kind of luxury items or others uh, the crisis may last longer than expected and that's why we titled this a prolonged covid19 environment uh, tell us about pandemics and what you've studied on them sean how we should think about covid19 and any pandemic frankly yeah, well, there's no doubt, I think, that this is going to last much longer than people expect. This is going to last until uh, one of two things happen, neither of which are going to happen in the, uh, in the very short term. And that is either uh, until we develop a vaccine or very effective cure. I think everybody thinks we're at least nine to 12 months minimum away on a vaccine. Maybe we'll discover an effective cure before then, but... Um, but we can't just completely count on that. Um, or until uh, we get herd immunity the natural way, which is until enough of the world's population has been exposed to this, that, that they have some natural immunities to it and the uh, pandemic spread begins to, to stop as a result of that. Counting on that is a little is a little risky itself because when it comes to coronaviruses, they're rather notorious for the fact that the immunities aren't all that long lasting. Sometimes just a couple of months or less. There is evidence that for this particular virus, it may not even be <laughs> that long. Um, or in a few cases, it could be a few years. But the point is that uh, the immunities, the natural immunities gained from exposure to the virus. Um, aren't necessarily going to be lasting. And that combined with the fact that uh, the way viruses naturally uh, tend to come in waves where you have the first wave, which is usually the biggest, though the second wave is often more deadly. Um, the first wave is usually the biggest, um, but then mitigation steps are taken, other um, steps are taken to limit spread, spread begins to decline, people start to get a little confident again, they venture back out in the world, and then the second wave hits. Oftentimes the second wave is a mutation of the virus, and um, sometimes that mutation takes a, a more deadly form. Um, in the Spanish flu of 1918, for example, uh, the second wave was, was smaller, I mean, but, but more deadly. Um, so, I think this is something that we're going to be dealing with at least through the end of this year. We may we may uh, rid ourselves of it mostly uh, by midsummer to late summer, but certainly come late fall over the winter, I think we can expect it to come roaring back again. I think we'll have to implement a lot of the same sort of mitigation techniques unless we have much wider spread testing and much greater uh, ability, uh, accessibility to masks and those sort of things. So it's gonna be a long term here. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and, and we're going to be dealing with this at least through, I think, the first quarter of 2021. Yeah, absolutely. And for that reason, too, businesses should think about postponing capital expenditures. Some businesses are are actually doing well right now. They're considered essential. Uh, if, if they need additional equipment, it'd probably be better to lease it instead of buying it right now. But uh, really plan on the long haul, not the short term, without a doubt. 
All right, Sean, uh, that brings us to strategy six, which is many business owners may have had the foresight to own a captive insurance company. Um, tell us a little bit about a captive and how it can help a business in a time like this. Well, captive insurance companies are used for a lot of different reasons. They can be used to replace insurance that a business owner normally buys from some unrelated commercial carrier. But a great many small and mid-sized business owners in particular will use captive insurance companies to uh, formally insure risk that they were previously just going naked on um, through their own related captive insurance company. And uh, the beauty of this is uh, that the captive insurance company, you're going to be, your business is buying more uh, insurance from that captive. And so you have more insurance coverage to your business, but also that captive is typically maintaining a pool of liquidity, a pool of cash or highly liquid investments. And so when a crisis comes, there are multiple ways of essentially accessing the money in that captive to help the business get through the crisis. One of course is filing a claim if you have business interruption insurance and your business was interrupted because you lost a key supplier or one of your key customers bankrupted and you just lost a you know six or seven figure account receivable that you're not going to be able to collect now, well, you can file that claim if you have coverage for that and, and obviously uh, be reimbursed at least in part for your loss that way. But even for business owners who may not be covered for this particular circumstance for some reason, uh, they can still potentially access some of that excess liquidity that builds up in their captive through dividends from the captive, through uh, borrowing or taking loans from the captive insurance company. You got to be careful about it. You got to do it responsibly and on commercial terms and not in an excessive amount, but certainly it can be done. Um, and so there are multiple ways of accessing the liquidity within the captive insurance company to keep a, a business afloat. Very good points. Absolutely. So I'll give a quick definition. Sean talked about captives. Uh, it is really owning your own insurance company uh, as a business owner or as a holding company or a group of related businesses. And captives essentially can do everything that uh, normal insurance companies do. They really have an exception in that their license is limited. They're not able to just go out and write insurance, say auto liability for the citizens of your state. Uh, that, would, that would land you in jail. But they are able to insure business and related business entities. So very powerful tool. They've been around since the 50s. Many of you already know about captive insurance uh, and the, the wide range of things they can do. We can certainly share more about captives uh, if you have an interest in learning more. Some things that they do, uh, replace commercial insurance, very often used to help control insurance costs. Maybe taking all or a portion of your commercial insurance spend. Uh, normally, if you do that, it's backstopped with a reinsurance carrier so that you don't bear all that risk on your own. Uh, they also can insure enterprise risks. These are often risks where businesses, like Sean said, are naked. They're uninsured or underinsured, uh, maybe gaps in policies, if you will. So these can also be black swan type of coverages. Captives also insure warranties. Uh, they also insure bonds, uh, can do subcontractor default bonding, for example, or performance bonding. Very powerful way to create a profit center out of thin air. They can also insure employee benefits, uh, health care and help control you know, your healthcare insurance costs and even turn that into a profit center as well. And what's great about captives is they can also combine uh, many of the things above into one insurance company, which really provides efficiency in running the captive. So that makes them uh, a more and more versatile, powerful tool for small mid-market businesses. And that can, they can really come through in a time like this. One of the benefits of captives as well, and we won't spend a lot of time on it, is that insurance companies are able to, or, or large insurance companies are able to really defer uh, taxes. They're able to use uh, actuarial calculations for loss reserving, and then really not pay money, uh, not pay taxes on that money as they set it aside 
for future losses. Well, small insurance companies can do the same. In fact, uh, in 1986, uh, the, um, the 831 B tax election was created, which allows small mid-sized companies who receive premiums to their captive of 2.3 million or less to be taxed at 0% on their underwriting profit in the captive. This is designed to help small mid-sized companies accumulate um, the loss reserves needed uh, for potential claims. So very, very powerful uh, tax benefits as well of owning an insurance company to help build up those loss reserves for when the money's needed to save the business. And benefits of captive ownership, I won't dwell on these, but uh, we'll send you the slides. There's a, a wide range of things that a captive can do to help a business weather a storm, if you will. So why don't we pause here and let's take a second for any questions. The, the second part of our discussion today is really gonna be on preparing for the next black swan. And we've talked about COVID-19, we've talked about it being prolonged. So let's pause if you've got questions you wanna ask, uh, maybe just come off mute or hit the chat bar and we'll tackle a few questions and then go through preparing for the next black swan. All right, sounds, sounds, looks like uh, we should keep moving. So um, let's keep diving in. So let's think about the next black swan. What might that be after surviving COVID-19? What should businesses do? Sean, what are your thoughts here? Well, you know, these are always opportunities. And, uh, you know, the, the statistic was at least until up, uh, a few while, uh, maybe a, a decade or two ago, that um, that more millionaires were were made during the Great Depression than at any other time in American history uh, on a percentage uh, basis. So yes, very volatile times can be very impactful, but it's important to remember that's true in both directions. Uh, some people are going to be negatively impacted. Some are going to be very very positively impacted and there are uh, opportunities galore for people who manage to have enough cash at the end of the day um, to take advantage of those opportunities there are going to be opportunities to buy up distressed assets you know those can be hard assets potentially like real estate that if we have a real estate crisis which is a real possibility um, becomes significantly less expensive than it was before you know we have oil trading at four to six bucks a gallon, unbelievable discounts in, in oil prices. And I don't think there are too many people that think, um, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, oil is still going to be trading at, you know, four to six to eight bucks a gallon anywhere in the world. So uh, there are fire sales that happen as a result of very distressed times. And to the extent we can preserve our liquidity to take advantage of them, that can be huge. If we are one of those companies that takes the steps we're talking about, if we can take advantage of the, the, the payroll or paycheck protection program, if we can access life insurance, cash surrender values, lines of credit, uh, other things to, to get through the next few months, uh, we'll probably enter in a world where many of our competitors who uh, we're not as well positioned or not as um, did not exercise as good a judgment or foresight, they may, uh, they may no longer be in business. And so we may have an opportunity to buy up competitors, to buy up their assets, or to just gain larger market share as the economy begins to, uh, to recover. So ways to kind of start preparing for what's next. It is too late, really, to prepare for COVID-19. <laughs> Um, you can take some mitigation steps, but there's no way at this point to be fully prepared. Believe it or not, we do have clients calling us several times a week saying, hey, you know, that captive insurance you guys talked to us about back in the fall, and I said, no, can, can, can we still get it? And the answer is, yeah, you can get it, but it's going to exclude COVID-19 because you can't buy insurance once your house is already on fire. Um, 
And so there, it may, uh, it would cover other types of pandemic diseases and that may occur in the future. And um, it may cover all sorts of other black swans that are surely going to happen. Again, we know that these things will happen. We just don't know what they will be or when they'll happen. Um, we can insure them through commercial insurance, through captive insurance, um, and we can be very well positioned uh, to survive, not to survive, but to prosper in the next black swan type of environment. One of the things that uh, that are important is just investing decisions, I will say, about captive insurance companies. If you have clients who have captives, I think it's important to, to be having conversations with them to set a couple of expectations. Number one, claims this year are definitely going to be higher than in prior years. If their captive insurance company participates in a risk distribution pool, um, they're, they're going to have significantly higher claims. Now, those claims aren't going to bankrupt their captive. They're not going to be like off the charts. In fact, they're probably not even going to exceed last year's tax savings. Almost certainly not going to exceed last year's tax savings for those clients who, uh, who, who took advantage of the tax savings. Um, but uh, they will be significantly higher, and we need to be preparing them for that. I think that will probably come as no surprise to most of them. And then secondly, we need to be reminding them that captives are potentially doubly exposed in this type of, type of circumstance. At the same time that their liabilities are potentially going up because of more claims, their assets, depending on how they have invested, can potentially be going down because of market losses unless they have hedged that risk, as we generally always encourage our clients to do through various hedging strategies, including sometimes um, equity index type of products. So um, they ought to be maintaining more liquidity in anticipation of potentially higher claims, and they may want to be revisiting their asset policy statement uh, just to make sure that they're not taking undue risk and subjecting themselves to significant potential losses uh, between now and the time those claims are paid. Very good point. So as you think about the next black swan, definitely evaluate your commercial insurance policies. It may be places that you can buy insurance for the future. Think about threats to your business. And maybe this crisis gives you kind of a new perspective on what the next black swan or black swans could be. Uh, and then if you own a captive insurance company, definitely evaluate those policies as well. Make sure you've got a good, broad mix of coverage uh, that kind of anticipates all the different ways your business could suffer. If you don't own a captive insurance company, many businesses that you advise, uh, if they don't have a captive, should consider forming or owning their own captive insurance company. This chart here uh, is, we'd be glad to share it with you as well. This kind of gives an idea of the many types of industries that captives serve. And, Certainly there are more beyond this chart, but it's a really good place to start. But you can see the captives can play a huge role in protecting a business and then especially in protecting things like enterprise risk down at the bottom, which many black swans fall into. Remember, we talked about how captives can insure risks that are commonly un uninsured or underinsured. And this chart lays out some of those. Sean, as you think about um, black swan events, what are some that really stand out to you that we might see in the future? Uh, some that might be on this chart and how to be thinking about them for the business? Oh, yeah. I mean, if we knew those, you know, those details, they wouldn't be black swans. But, um, but I think that if we look at any business, there are, and we look under the hood, uh, most businesses are subjected to a large variety of, uh, of risks. And, most captive insurance companies will issue policies that would protect against a large variety of risks. So we don't necessarily have to know the specific cause of a loss, so long as we have a policy that is written in such a way that it captures a, a, a variety of risk exposures. So what are those types of things that we're talking about? Well, administrative actions risk, the first one listed under operational risk is an example. This is the risk of some government 
regulator or government entity coming in and auditing you, investigating you, suspending your license, subjecting you to some sort of order that um, does harm to your to your business. Well, certainly, uh, executive orders from governors uh, telling businesses that they must shut down if they are non-essential for X number of weeks is an example, I think, of an administrative action. And a great many administrative actions policies would provide coverage for, in some cases, loss of revenue, but certainly for um, any expenses, hard dollar expenses that businesses had to incur um, to comply with those uh, administrative actions. Another one uh, that's relevant just in our, our current environment would be, um, you know, potentially reputational damages. You know, what if you're a nursing home? And what if, God forbid, COVID-19, you did all you could do, but COVID-19 gets loose in your nursing home and you, you're all over the press, you're all over the front pages, people are disparaging you and saying that you didn't take care of your, uh, your customers. You know, that's a reputational risk. Um, and, and that sort of loss could very well be covered under some of these types of policies. Going up into the strategic risk area, we've got general business interruption and that takes lots of different forms. Loss of a key uh, customer. Uh, what if your customer has gone bankrupt? What if your customer, uh, their business has been forcibly closed by executive order and so they're no longer buying from you they cancel their contract or they default on their contract loss of a key supplier what if you were getting your uh, you know you're, you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer and you're getting 80 percent of your raw materials out of asia out of china uh, to go into manufacturing your pharmaceuticals as a great many pharmaceutical manufacturers did um, you know that's a, a supply chain interruption um, you have um, a wide variety of these type of policies. The, the broad form property damage coverage, which is the very last one mentioned there, this will often provide coverage to businesses who are for, cannot access their property because of some sort of an event that takes place or because of a governmental order that prohibits businesses from opening, from operating. Um, so there are a wide variety of these policies that could cover situations such as the one we're facing now. We don't know what the black swan of the future is going to look like, but we do know that, uh, that something like it will happen again. And we want to be among those businesses that have this type of insurance and that have that liquidity pool inside their captive insurance company rather than one of those businesses that don't. Yeah, absolutely. And Sean, in line with that, uh, you know, we just shared our chart on uninsured, underinsured risks that businesses can prepare for. Uh, certainly, don't take our word for it. Uh, our federal government at the Small Business Disaster website advises the same, right? I remember when you, uh, you found this chart when we were doing research uh, and uh, the excitement as, as we went through this chart about uh, our own federal government advises businesses yeah, to be so, ready for these types of risks, yeah. Exactly, you know, it's a shame that the IRS is so skeptical about some of these types of risks. I think that, I think that the coronavirus is, is, is probably gonna change their attitude to some degree eventually, and certainly the court's attitude in some of these cases. Uh, I think in the past, there has been a perception that, you know, maybe some of these risks just really weren't all that real, just not that likely to happen and yada yada. Um, and, and sure enough, we've, we've seen what's happened. So yeah, this chart is taken from ready.gov, which is the Department of Homeland Security's disaster preparedness website. And on that website, they have a landing page for businesses. And they're on that page imploring businesses in general and small businesses in particular to consider these one-off type of risks that can devastate a small business. Unlike a Fortune 1000 company, where when something goes wrong, they can just float some more bonds, issue some more stock, or even get a government bailout. Uh, most small and mid-side business, businesses don't have that opportunity, at least not to the same extent. 
And, uh, and so a risk uh, loss that may just knock a few dollars off the earnings per share of a Fortune 1000 company may be an existential threat to a small and mid-market business. The government recognizes it. And on this chart here on the left-hand side, you'll see the very risk that the government is imploring our business owners to, to consider, to plan for, and to plan around. And among them listed there is pandemic disease. Right below that is utility outage. What happens if there's a cyber attack on our electrical grid and we're without power for 60 days, 90 days? I mean, folks here in Puerto Rico, post Maria, uh, can tell you just how devastating that is uh, on, a, on a, uh, a, a country or a state and, uh, and its businesses. You have supply failure, uh, supplier failure, which is certainly going on as we speak now. Um, there are, you know, hazardous uh, materials, spills, or releases that are a possibility that can make entire sections of a city or a town uh, off limits into no man's land for some period of time. And if your business just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, you know, that can put you out of business. So there are all types of these threats. The government itself is imploring small businesses to take them seriously and, um, and we can plan for them through many of the techniques that we've been talking about today. Yeah, and uh, we're almost at the end and can open up for some questions. I've got somebody popped up in the chat bar here. So let's look and see what they're gonna ask. Someone mentioned to me about index UL, universal life and fixed indexing annuity. What are your thoughts on this product pros cons? not researched it yet may not be the conference call for this question okay this is christy from florida no i think it's a great question um yeah in equity index universal life equity index annuities i think the, the life insurance variety is normally going to be a better fit at least for clients who have a longer term time horizon uh, than the annuity variety is uh, simply because the they offer higher rates of return than the annuity variety does. But equity index products are simply products backed by a life insurance company and by the guarantees of that life insurance company that offer a rate of return tied to or linked to some sort of equity index, stock market index, like the S&P 500 though uh, many products have other index options to choose from uh, besides the S&P 500 as well. And what these products do is they credit you with a return um, linked to that index performance subject to a floor and a cap. For example, maybe we have an equity index product linked to the S&P 500 with a zero floor and a 12% cap. What's that mean? That means if the S&P 500 goes up 8% over the last 12 months, we're gonna get credited with 8% interest in our product. If it goes up 10%, we'll get credited with 10% interest. If it goes up 15% though, we're gonna get capped out at 12. 12 is the max that we can ever earn in a given year if our cap in this product is 12%. By contrast though, if the market drops 40% in a week or two weeks, or certainly a month, uh, like it has recently, uh, we have a floor, meaning that um, we can't lose any of our principal as a result of market performance. If the market goes down 40%, then we simply, over that 12-month period, we simply get credited with no interest, zero. That's our floor, zero. But we don't lose any of our principal to that market correction or that market performance. So they can be a fantastic way over time to, and I would emphasize that, these are longer term investment vehicles typically, but they can be in a fantastic way over time to earn a rate of return consistent with long term stock market averages while taking less risk um, than the stock market as a whole does because of that floor and uh, the cap. So yes, they can be ideal tools whether used as an investment vehicle for a captive insurance company, whether used as just a uh, asset allocation class for an individual investor, um, these equity index products can be, um, can be quite compelling. 
end. Um, certainly, you got to look at them product by product and company by company. But in the right circumstances, they they can be a great fit. Outstanding. Very good, very good question and great answer, Sean. A uh, couple more slides, guys. Uh, we talked about captive insurance and you're thinking about the next potential Black Swan event and the New York Times just published an article uh, just a little over a week ago titled, One Scrutinized an Insurance Product Becomes a Crisis Lifeline. So in the Wealth Matters section of the New York Times, they, uh, the columnist writes, small captive insurance companies are proving to be beneficial as the coronavirus pandemic shuts down local economies. So it's great to see the New York Times actually recognize that and certainly many other publications are as well. Uh, we do think as you're advising clients that this may be something that many of your clients should look at in getting ready for uh, what lies ahead. So uh, when I send you the, if you want the slides, it's got a link to that article as well. And so let's open it up for questions. Feel free to put one in the chat bar or feel free to just unmute and ask your questions. My email's on here, so if you'd like the slides, shoot me a note and I will be glad to send them to you. Any questions? Well, if there are no questions, then uh, we will thank you guys for joining and uh, wish you and yours um, uh, happy and hopefully very healthy uh, next few months. It can be challenging when we're all stuck at home. Uh, for those of us who may have small kids who are out of school and we're with them for days or weeks on end and also trying to do our day jobs, um, that can also be particularly stressful and, and combine that with constant feed of uh, challenging news and, and and things can be challenging, but we're all in this together. We're, we're definitely all going to get through this um, and we're going to come out the other side, I think, a, a much smarter and a much better prepared company to uh, country to, to deal with these sort of black swan events. So if anybody needs anything, if we can help you or your clients in any way, please let us know. Otherwise, um, do stay safe. Do please... <laughs> Uh, keep yourself at a distance from others for the time being and uh, hunker down for another couple of weeks. And I think we'll, we'll start to look pretty good here by, by probably the first part of May. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. And thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, any questions, please reach out. We'll be honored to help you in any way we can. Y'all have a great day.